I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI Podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are discussing dementia and geriatric mental health with Dr. Daniel Goldfarb. Welcome, Dr. Goldfarb. Thank you. Great to be here. My first question for you is, how did you become involved in the study of Alzheimer's disease and mental health in geriatrics? Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with that? I can. So... My response to why I became involved in geriatric mental health and Alzheimer's is a little bit different than a lot of my colleagues. So many of us have had family members who have suffered from Alzheimer's disease or other dementias throughout our lives, but that actually wasn't my story. So I started out and did the world of dementia for a hospice dementia program. And what really r- struck me not having really been exposed to dementia in my family, the Mm -hmm. profound amount of loss and grief that each person, including the person with dementia and also the family members, were experiencing over such a long period of time. And there was really no, not much support or a system within our healthcare framework to even have the words to talk about this. And so really Mm -hmm. there was such a need to support patients and families and, of course, find better treatments. And this hospice dementia program that I was working with was even helping people, you know, feel better, improve quality of life at end of life and supporting caregivers. And it was so inspiring. And I saw hope even at that stage. And so that is what inspired me to go into this field. That's excellent. What are the early diagnoses? diagnostic stages of Alzheimer's disease. I know that you've done some work in this area in terms of research. Can you share a little bit more with us about the early diagnostic stages? It's interesting because this question about what the early diagnostic stages are of Alzheimer's is changing as we speak because of our learning about that actually the Alzheimer's disease brain changes start up to 20 years before any symptoms. And so the definition of what is early is really changing. So historically, it has been when there's been some subtle or mild changes in any aspect of memory or thinking, which could include also language, visual spatial skills, executive function, attention reasoning. And so it's, you know, the beginnings of these subtle changes that are more than we'd expect for someone's age and education level, but that person's still functioning independently. And so that's, you know, that's defined as mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. And then when there's functional impairment in some way, that moves into progresses to mild dementia. However, with these brain changes that we've now identified biologically occurring, namely the amyloid, the amyloid protein starts building up 20 years before, and we now have the technology to identify this. Soon, we will really change our diagnostic criteria and framework to call early Alzheimer's. It will be preclinical. It will be before there's any symptoms. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it does seem to be an ever-changing field as we learn more and more in the coming years. What sort of brain changes, as you mentioned, can occur up to 20 years prior to any symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? So the first changes that we've detected that occur in Alzheimer's disease are the buildup of the beta amyloid protein in the brain. Mm -hmm. And again, that can start up to two decades before the symptoms. And so when I, you know, meet with my friends who are in their 40s, you know, we say, I say, we better, you know, get exercising more now because Mm -hmm. this could be building up in any of us. And so about 10 to 15 years before cognitive changes We do see the tau, the neurofibrillary tangles building up as well. And we know that those work with the amyloid. Somehow we haven't exactly figured out together Mm -hmm. to then ultimately lead to neurodegeneration, which is when the brain cells are dying. There's atrophy of the brain that we can detect on our MRIs and our FTG PET scan. So that's even occurring a few years before the actual 
cognitive symptoms, and I would just say that we now know that even the first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease can be neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, depression, irritability, new onset changes, you know, in someone who's not had those mood issues over their lifetime. So putting in a plug for keeping an eye out for that and our friends and family members. Wow, that's so interesting. What kind of biomarker testing can be done to determine if there have been some of these neurodegenerative changes? So really, this has been, there's been quite a revolution over the past decade since the amyloid PET scan came into play. And Mm -hmm. so before that, we even had cerebrospinal fluid detection methods for amyloid and tau, but that's through lumbar puncture. And while I'm a big advocate of lumbar puncture not really being that scary, you know, generally it's still not something people are running to ask their doctor to do. Right. So, so with the amyloid PET scan, which is a PET scans, you know, kind of CAT scan, where the tracer is injected into the vein. And so we, there are these tracers, these ligands developed to detect the amyloid. And also, so there's five amyloid tracers approved by the FDA. And there's one tau tracer that's approved, was approved in 2020. So those, uh, the amyloid and the tau pet are not yet reimbursed by Medicare or other insurance companies. Mm. What we can, uh, as a clinician, what we can get reimbursed are the, so we do the structural brain imaging with the MRI or the CAT scan. And that does show the biomarker of if there's atrophy of the hippocampus or those short-term memory centers in the medial temporal lobes and other cortical atrophy. But also we could do the FDG PET scan, which looks for functional changes with decreased metap energy usage in, in the temporal and parietal lobes in Alzheimer's disease. And then we can also have the CSF, the spinal fluid, covered by insurance companies, usually when there are cognitive changes, memory loss or dementia. I haven't, I've been lucky enough lately, insurance companies seem to be more willing to pay for those. Now, I would shift to individuals that don't have any cognitive concerns or memory loss, but maybe have a family history of Alzheimer's disease and are kind of worried that's going to happen. There's no test that's, again, paid for by insurance. We do have coming online in the next couple of years blood tests that can screen for amyloid and tau and some other workers. And what I predict is that that once there a disease modifying treatment is approved and actually reimbursed, then these blood tests are going to become mainstreamed into kind of a Medicare wellness visit by the primary care doctors. Wow, that would be amazing. It would. That's such great information. Thank you for sharing that with us. What would you say are some of the barriers to early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? How much do you think stigma plays a role as well when it comes to memory loss? So there are many barriers to early diagnosis and Alzheimer's disease across the board. And I (laughs) absolutely do not blame our primary care providers. What the situation is that we don't have a supportive system for patients and families when they are diagnosed yet. We don't have reimbursement for, say, counseling, for Mm -hmm. safety assessment, and for Mm -hmm. caregiver support and well-being, things that could really change the trajectory of the disease and the person's quality of life as well and the caregiver. So there's a little bit of nihilism about, well, what's the point of diagnosing early? And it's just going to, as you mentioned, stigma. This person Mm -hmm. will feel, you know, stigmatized. It may affect say, their employment, if they're still working, their ability to drive, they may lose friends. And these things absolutely do happen. Um, So there's also, it is, and there's a lack of education for Mm -hmm. primary care providers about this disease and lack of time. You know, many don't feel confident Mm -hmm. to uh, what to do once, once they diagnose, besides knowing about these symptomatic treatments we have available. So we really need to, as a whole system, change in this regard. Right, right. Why is dementia so underdiagnosed and what resources can help clinicians engage in earlier diagnosis? So I feel like this question is somewhat related to what we were just discussing. Yes, I think that in terms of how we can, what resources might be available to clinicians, educational Offerings like this podcast and like the NEI Symposium are really important. I think 
the subspecialists like myself, partnering with primary care physicians to provide education and to make it very real, make it very practical for them and the time constraints and demonstrating value in this. It is actually really, it's not yet been shown from a good data perspective on the value of early diagnosis because it's really hard to study these things and then to reproduce the studies. And so then we're left with, well, there's no evidence. So why are we going to do it? But with our older adult population, it's really hard to have evidence in general. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. But at the same time, it's clear that our dementia care is suboptimal across the board. And so um, I think us as a subspecialist, uh, we need to really kind of, we're in a bit of a bubble, frankly, and need to reach out more to our colleagues in primary care. Absolutely. What complex factors influence the clinician's decision to address dementia through diagnosis and communication? There are many complex factors that might influence a clinician to diagnose a patient and caregiver. Some of that has to do with their familiarity with diagnosis and treatment, feeling confident that they can have an impact. Also, from my experience, it's the patient and the care partner themselves advocating to say, I think there's something wrong here. I really do. Mm-hmm. Many times out of, I think, an altruistic place, a primary care doctor will normalize it and say, you know, I do the same thing. That's normal. And the reality is we don't know if it's normal in this person's case. And we know that our clinical diagnostic accuracy with Alzheimer's. So when only using clinical symptoms, we're wrong over a quarter of the time. So the person actually has something else going on in their brain. So we need to use more scientific methods and at least take the next step. And so I would I would say that everyone needs to start taking these concerns seriously. And there are studies when we hear them from our patients and families. And also, we really should be including a family member in a Medicare wellness visit, you know, because a patient's not going to necessarily even realize they're having trouble. It's part of the disease sometimes if there's a lack of awareness. And so they're, right. they might not break it up on their own. And so we really need to have care partner input perhaps is a requirement when you get to yeah. a certain age. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think even beyond the issue of having insight, I think sometimes, especially in the early stages, there's this sort of denial on the patient's part because it's so difficult to cope with that. And that's where, you know, caregivers can be so valuable for their input, right? True. Yes, absolutely. And even, as I mentioned before, these subtle mood changes, new onset mood changes that can happen, you know, a person, you know, I don't think any of us would go into a primary care doc and say, you know, like, I'm much more, I'm much crankier. You know, it's usually the family that mentions that. And if there's no precipitant, it should be, it should alert the clinician that there could be something going on. Yeah, yeah. As a memory expert, what resources can be helpful for geriatric patients who are in the early stages of mild cognitive impairment? What could you share with us? And I would say an excellent starting point for resources and for someone in the early stages, such as mild cognitive impairment or their family members, would be the Alzheimer's Association website, okay. which is alz.org. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So that's really a nice starting point to provide education, talks about events, talks about memory professionals in one's area. There's actually a hotline that can be called 24-7. And at that point, the person can branch out depending on what they need. I think that's a great starting point. Okay, that's excellent. What are the most common mental health conditions that the geriatric population faces besides dementia? The geriatric population faces a number of mental health conditions that have all been exacerbated by COVID, especially, I'd say, for this group. So depression is common in older adults and Social isolation and loneliness is mm-hmm. common and more common with COVID and has and compounds depression. Um, and as as many of your listeners, I'm sure know, the symptoms of geriatric depression are different than of uh, younger or you know general age adults and younger adults. 
and can be physical symptoms such as, you know, pain, stomach upset. And so we have to really ask those questions to get at the bottom of that. And I would say, I would add that again, the symptoms, we now know that these symptoms of mental health changes in older adults might actually be a harbinger of Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it has mm-hmm. to do with, well, Alzheimer's changes are affecting the brain in certain areas that are also contributing to things like depression. And also I didn't mention a huge one is apathy. And so whether that's because of a neurodegenerative disease or, you know, other psychosocial reasons are probably a combination. That's mm-hmm. absolutely something yeah. to keep an eye out for. And is apathy is often the most debilitating, especially for family members. Right, right. In what ways does polypharmacy complicate mental health conditions in the geriatric population? We know that this is a concern, particularly for this population. Can you share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Polypharmacy is rampant, of course, in our older adults. And in terms of mental health and cognitive issues, uh, many medications are, they're sedating, they're essentially just push people down and Mm -hmm. might lower the heart rate slightly, might interact with other medications, make people sleepy. And so there's this sort of lethargy that can occur, which then leads to the cycle of losing the routine and the structure, not engaging in the activities, not having a good sleep-wake schedule, napping during the day, and then it's just this vicious cycle because then more medications like sleep medications get started to, so the person will sleep at night even though the issue is they're sleeping. You know, they should stop napping. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it's the need to get to the root cause. And that's about really having to have long conversations with patients and families, which, as you know, can be challenging in our healthcare system. Yes. So this takes me to my last question, which is, what could you share about lifestyle changes and how to protect mental health in this vulnerable population? Lifestyle changes are something that I often, I bring into every visit with my older adult population. Because we know that, well, specifically for healthy brain aging, that the most important things that we can do or what we know we can do are exercise, specifically aerobic exercise, cognitive Mm -hmm. stimulation, and socialization. Mm -hmm. And so what we see often is that as a person retires, it's all often feels it's nice and they have free time and they're less stressed But then what happens is, again, their daily schedule and routine and activities become derailed. They feel less purpose in their day-to-day life because they don't have that built-in structure. And so part of what I do is, first, when I meet the person, get to know them, who they've been, what they've done for work, what their schedule's like, what their hobbies are, you know, do have they been an exerciser or have they been into certain activities? And then when I meet them and if they're in a, what I call sometimes a retirement rut, I'll talk about, you know, how can you, the person, not, I'm not going to do that for them, but how can you bring in some of these activities slowly back into your life? Um, and even if that only involves, say, going for a brisk walk for 10 minutes, three times a week, but you've been a walker previously. So I know that you have that as part of your Uh, muscle memory and enjoyment. So, and then requiring in that visit that they set a goal, they have to set the goal and what days and generally times do they think they're going to be able to do this and making it really seem manageable. And then that, and then I talk about how that's also just going to help improve their weekly structure and routine in general, which has many benefits across the board. So it's really about making these behavioral changes feel very doable and sustainable. That's great. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all of this wonderful information with us. And thank you for being on our show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 